So hopefully you've watched the first two episodes in this series and you've, uh, you understand that diagnosis is a very, very integral part of the process of recovering from a slap tear. And the second episode, we should have convinced you by now that exercise is going to be paramount to your recovery, irrespective of the path you choose, whether that be through surgical intervention or just exercise alone with a good physical therapist uh, beside you at, or a good strength coach like myself or Rad. Today, we're going to go one step further and we're going to talk about a general approach to constructing a workout to both rehabilitate a shoulder slap tear and then take you beyond the slap tear into recovery and strength training uh, beyond that. And this is really, really important. It's something that I think everybody should know because it's going to help you construct workouts for anything you do, for the lower body, for the upper body, for the arms, the legs, the shoulders, uh, everything. And uh, of course, we're going to be talking today about structural balance training. Welcome to the Unity Gym podcast brought to you by VPA Australia, our trusted supplement source since day one. As VPA-sponsored athletes, we're excited to offer you a special 10% discount on their premium supplements available worldwide. Just use our discount code listed in the episode description. Today's episode is also sponsored by the Slap Tear Rehab Blueprint. If you're overwhelmed by rehab tips on social media, our blueprint provides clear, results-based methods to help you return to your favorite activities faster and stronger than surgery can get you there. Best of all, it's free. Grab it through the link in our description. If you'd like a personalized slap tear rehab program tailored to your needs and goals and support every step of the way via online one-on-one -on -one coaching, check out my slap tear rehab program. To get started, click the link in the description, create an account, complete a short pre-exercise questionnaire, and I'll welcome you on the inside. And remember, as Amazon affiliates, you can get all the equipment used in our videos and podcasts at competitive prices through our affiliate links in the description. Now let's dive into today's episode. And of course, I've got my good friend, Phil White back. Phil, how are you going? Very well. Great series, really important and something that you know is close to our heart via being on our shoulders because we both both experienced this and both gone through it. So um, yeah, it's definitely something I like sharing sharing the lessons, both the uh, <laughs> mistakes made and the um, yeah and the victories. So absolutely, and, and just a re reminder, you know, uh, both Rad, myself, and Phil have all had to rehab a shoulder slap tear before, and uh, to my knowledge, you didn't have surgery, did you? Nope. No, yeah, and so the, I guess you know these are three circumstances or instances where. It was uh, op sur surgery was always optional and it was actually recommended for me and it was recommended for rad, but we chose because of our baseline strength and the fact that we already trained a lot. Uh, it was definitely not um, uh, absolutely essential uh, to go down the path of surgery, but there are circumstances where it may be, and I don't want you to feel you know, like you're, you should be ashamed of that. If you, if surgery is something that you've been told is, is really, really important for your recovery, then th that's okay. You know, but remember if you watch the second episode, irrespective of whether that's the case or not, exercise is going to be absolutely key to your recovery for so many reasons. And I do urge you all, if you missed the second episode to go back and watch that, uh, because, you know, th there's there's reasons beyond just the, uh, the 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 neural effects of training. You know, one side of the body it's going to uh, complement the other side of the body. There are uh, there are um, just general health reasons to continue exercising. You know, bone mineral density and muscle mass uh, losing that as you age is a real problem and can become a, a really really big problem. And that's not something we want any of you to have to deal with. So. Exercise is key. So how do we exercise? And this is very general. And of course, uh, if you are training sports specific for a, for a very, very specific role in a, uh, in a certain sport or something like that, these, um, uh, th these recommendations might vary a little bit. And that's why it's important to work with yeah, a good coach. Probably not, not as much as a lot of people would think really. Like you say it that's is very true. general, but like, that's one of the things that I've just changed my mind about the most since starting this whole you know, journey from being a patient for so many years and thinking like everything was so kind of specific and complicated going through becoming a massage therapist and trying to like, you know, figure out all the Kung Fu moves that you do to like align someone perfectly and, you know, release just right things so that they're like <laughs> do all this technical hands-on stuff to then doing a sports science degree and understanding uh, sports like an exercise science more, more generally, understanding how the body adapts to different um, things. And then 
like over that time starting to to train strength with you guys um spending years training in a gym spending years training with uh sebastian or a strength coach and then like from that then doing my doctor physio postgrad and like kind of putting it all together with that physio and rehab approach like it's kind of made me realize like that and then you know from there working with patients like working my own injuries like kind of seeing that although like you know specificity matters like going through understanding what structures are involved all of that like understanding what sports you're doing understanding you know your, your needs your age like any like conflicting you know, or injuries that might like influence it or health conditions whatever like <clears throat> all of those things are really key really important but then at the end of the day like we all have the same body and there are some fundamental movements that everybody should do and when building a strong system uh as a body like we want to make sure that we're ticking kind of <laughs> the big boxes and then when thinking about joint systems themselves so the shoulder being one joint system like there are some key things that the shoulder needs like should ideally be able to do and there's only like so many ways you can train that and then obviously there's going to be specificity in like rep ranges intensity all the variables we're going to go through today but at the end of the day like i think one of the biggest mistakes we'll make is like not understanding those kind of big fundamental movements and thinking of every exercise as being this individual complicated thing that needs to be put together in some like wildly complicated way when really like if you can understand like the general themes of exercise thinking about exercise in movement patterns rather than like specific names <laughs> and then yep. knowing like the key progression variables and then thinking okay what do i need to be able to do for my sport my life my interests and then just like tweaking those variables on those big fundamental movements then like I find more and more like my rehab programs just like they all like there's a lot more similarity than I think like a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking. And, and I've and, actually and professionally just on that like yep. I think there's also like the, I also get freaked out as like a person who is very qualified and like I feel like I need to be valuable and there's a real like you know just to be very candid and honest here like you kind of feel like you need to make things complicated to make it seem valuable but it's such a like mistake as a professional because like the thing that we really need to get is like people to understand how to help themselves they need to feel like it's attainable and like approachable so like by simplifying it as much as possible obviously no simpler than it needs to be but as simple as it can be then i think that that's the way to go so as a professional yeah. that's been a, like a <laughs> uh taken a while to become like comfortable with that i guess yeah, <laughs> thank me, you for being maybe getting a bit thank, honest here <laughs> thank you for being so honest and and uh, i can certainly relate because i spent years thinking I had to write everybody a completely different program when I was working in a big gym because I was afraid that they would see that they're doing the same or similar program to someone else. And I was like, oh my God, what's that going to, you know, they're going to think, oh my God, I'm just like, you know, copying yeah. and pasting. But the reality is that there, there are three, very, there are three principles that stand true no matter what you're doing. And we're going to cover them and, and largely one of them. And, and they are uh, like, for, no matter what style of training you're doing, no matter what style of exercise, Structural balance training, which we're going to really, really go deep on today. Uh, and, and these sound complicated, but trust me, they're not. Progressive overload and, and general load management. And those three principles stand true no matter what you're doing. And, and general load management, we've spoken about so much, and I'm not going to go super deep on that. That's basically just making sure that the, uh, the dosage that you're um, exposing yourself to in any sort of sport or physical activity matches your capability at, at, at each point in time. So you're not, you know, um, you're not doing too much and and then taking into consideration other variables in your life like stress factors uh work what you do you know what you're doing during the day and how is that impacting uh the the, the load that you're prescribed in the gym you know and make sure that that all fits into the right puzzle and that's your program you know yeah. progressive don't overload do, don't do too much too soon is load management in a nutshell is like in a nutshell <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah. yeah exactly progressive overload is then taking that concept and progressing it with your evolution you know as your body adapts and, and evolves then you, you, you've got to sort of increase the amount of load that you're exposed to to get the same result and it's you know there's a fine line there in in, in being able to uh, get it right and not overdo it and and of course that's one of the blessings of working with a good coach or a good physical therapist they're going to help you with that so those two are key but this concept of structural balance and I'm going to uh, ha have a crack at explaining this from a strength and conditioning perspective uh, from a personal trainer and then I'll let Phil fill in the blanks uh, or the gaps that I miss as a, a physical therapist and sports exercise scientist. Now, 
um, I had a mechanical engineering background before becoming a personal trainer and I wanted to build race cars. That was my passion. And so I have a good understanding of mechanics and I understand the concept of a force coupling, which is this concept of having a, a, a you know, two opposing forces that stabilize uh, a, a joint, you know. And, and so if we were to make this really, really obvious, uh, a, a good joint because it really only moves in two directions is the elbow. You've got your um, biceps and your triceps producing force on either side to create both movement and stability in that joint. And that's a real, real basic level. If we were to go a little bit more advanced, something like the shoulder joint and for your, uh, you know, for you, for everyone here, who's here because they've got a slap tear, it gets a little bit more complicated because there is uh, a really obvious series of muscles on the outside. And, you know, just to keep things super simple, let's say we've got the pec muscles, the chest that produces force, uh, bringing the shoulder um, uh, forward. Uh, and then you've got the muscles on the back uh, producing force, bringing the shoulder outward like that. Um, um, and and then on the inside, you've got the rotator cuff, which creates this sort of stability to make sure that the, the, the shoulder stays in the socket and doesn't become dislocated when a big muscle on the outside yanks it in a direction. And all of those muscles working intrinsically together create this sort of force coupling where it it actually creates in and of itself uh, beyond just movement it creates stability and it creates uh, um, uh, positioning you know it keeps everything where it's meant to be uh, and so it, it, when we're talking about structural balance training what we're really referring to uh, and there, there are a couple of ways to break this down we're referring to first and foremost, is the front and the back even? So for every pushing exercise you do, and this is really, really simplifying things, are you doing pulling exercises to offset that and to complement that? Yeah, uh, just to give people like a, again, oversimplified kind of uh, visual to have of that, like think of tug of war, um, tug of war competition. You, you want to have, like if the sides are equal and matched, <laughs> then the like they're not going to go anywhere. Whereas if one side's much stronger than the other, then it's going to go that direction. So that's just like exactly, a very oversimplified exactly. thing yeah. to get the concept I, across. Exactly. I used to I used to like the analogy that, that I use with my clients of a sailing ship. You know, you've got the mast and the mast has to stay true and uh, and in the center of the boat. And if you've got rigging on one side of the boat that's tighter than the other, uh, then the mast is going to have uh, this this you know pressure pulling it to one side. And if you get into a storm where you you, you know it's exposed to really strong wind, it's likely going to snap pulled to the side that's that, that that's taut and tighter. A um, little bit more complicated, but I, I like that analogy. I don't know why. So then uh, going back to what is structural balance. So we've got the first thing, which is is the chest as strong as the back, and vice versa. And then, of course, we can take that. That's on a horizontal push pull. So we can also take that in a vertical plane. So is the shoulders uh, strong enough in relation to the muscles in the back that pull down, like the the chin up muscles, the lats, uh, and, and so on. And then beyond that, we've got left to right side. So is the left side of the body as strong as the right side of the body, and vice versa? And then finally, the the um uh, or the th sorry, not finally, the third side of structural balance is other legs, you know, and the upper body both strong, or is you know, is are we dealing with someone who skipped leg day too many times? Um, and then the final, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, is is the inner unit that creates stability strong enough uh, to, to support the outer unit that creates the majority of movement. And there are only really, you know, two joints that people refer to when they talk about inner and outer unit for that uh, um, uh, sort of concept, and that's sort of the hip and the shoulder. And Phil, you probably say that there's uh, uh, some people like to talk about the core and things like that, but I like to keep it really simple and just say like, you know, you've got muscles in the hip that help sort of stabilize the hip joint. It needs a lot less stability. Yeah, so I think just to, to simplify it, like you, you have muscles in your body that are considered like your prime movers for exercises. So they're what you're saying there is like the outer unit. So you're sort of big muscles that are all about producing like force or, um, or, or strength or movement. So like your, um, your gastroc your, and your calves, your, your quads, your hammies, your glutes, um, your big back muscles, your pecs, your lats, all of those ones which are, are really trying to make the, the muscles move. But again, if we think about the um, like the muscle as a, as a singular thing, like if all it can do is contract and relax. So if I think about my pec, if I was to, if you were just to, if you're watching the video, um, remove all of my, everything else except for my skeleton and then just whack a pec on there, like keep the pec in place. And then if that pec was to contract, it would be basically bringing, um, 
the so it attaches onto your sternum and then your collarbone and so it would basically bring the other attachment which is the like it attaches into the top of your humerus so the top of your upper arm bone it would basically bring it up into this position and anteriorly dislocate because all it can do is contract it's just shortening and then it's relaxing so if like as a prime mover it just <laughs> did that without any other muscles um, at play then we'd have a very dysfunctional body it'd be kind of like that um did you ever play quop q w o p on um uh, like a little browser game it is <laughs> wonderful it is just like the best example of this i can think of where it, it's basically like it's this little like 2d um sprinter it's like cartoony like very early internet um game where you, you just use the um q and w on one side and o and p on the other side of your keyboard and you're try like it's kind of unclear but like one is like controlling the lower leg one's like one's controlling the hip one's controlling the knee on one side and then O and P are, what, are doing the other side. And it's just so hard to make this like guy movies just falling over backwards. And you can sometimes get to this <laughs> rhythm where he sort of like shuffles along, but like, it's just such a beautiful representation of like muscles are dumb. Like all they can do is contract and relax. And if we didn't have these really incredible systems, as you talked about, of like these stabilizing muscles and um, these prime mover muscles working together so synergistically, then your body like it's not going to function very well. And so just to like clarify what stabilization means, because I think it's one of those words that people say but don't really understand. Um, so when thinking about this, like the stabilizer in the shoulder, what they're really doing is trying to keep the anterior glide or th they're trying to stop unwanted movement. And so when I said before about the pecs contracting, what would happen is I'd get my arm uh, reaching up in front of me, my thumb turning inwards and my shoulder joint coming out of the socket at the front. And so like we've got the tug of war happening with the um, pulling muscles at the back that are going to um, like help in that. But then you've got these deeper muscles that are attaching to your shoulder blade um, and like they're wrapping the, like one side is on the shoulder blade and the other side is wrapping around the head of the humerus. And their whole job is to keep the ball in the middle of the socket and not getting that anterior glide, which is that unwanted movement that would be that anterior dislocation. So their whole role as a stabilizer is to stop that unwanted movement and keep the ball in the middle of the socket, which if you're pay paying attention is also what the labrum does. It helps keep the ball in the middle of the socket and it's the passive structure that does that. So if we have these, like if we don't have very good structural balance in our system, we have these big dumb prime mover muscles that are causing lots of unwanted movement because we're not um, getting that balance between the big um, prime movers on either side. And we're not getting that um, sort of structural balance of and this is the one thing that I wanted to just like um, add to your explanation of the shoulder is that, you know, it's, it's kind of, if people think like, okay, pushing, pulling, got it. Like they're opposing movements. That's going to be all good. The key thing to remember is that like, and you don't probably not remember, but actually to learn, because most people don't uh, go deep into anatomy as I have, but um, your pecs and your lats. So your pecs being your big pushing muscles, your lats being your big pulling muscles are both internal rotators of the shoulder. So the, their attachments mean that you get an internal rotation force um, movement on um, your shoulder when you contract them but fortunately we also have external rotators which when you're trying to use your pecs to push or <laughs> to lift your arm up they're going to be working to keep that um to have that external rotation force in the joint which means that you're not just wrapping your arm around every time you try and do anything with your pecs so this, just just very quickly on that this is why in the ums and in most good strength and conditioning pro protocols and programs you will see that there is a a emphasis on external rotation isolation, but not internal rotation isolation. Because when we do all of our bench pressing, our chin ups, our bent over rows, we are getting quite a lot of internal rotation in the shoulder. And so what we find is the strength imbalance generally comes from the external rotators not being strong enough to maintain that stability through the big pressing movements and uh, and throwing and things like that that, that require that um, force or power generated through internal rotation and uh, shoulder uh, flexion. Is that right? That's no, no, that's shoulder adduction. So, oh yeah, basically, um, when you're push, pulling your arm forward, <laughs> you want to have something that's holding it kind of back, and that's like the the key thing there. So. Um, yeah, really important to understand. And like a great example of like this practically in like a kind of sports performance way is like when training with Australian strength coach, Sebastian Oro, when he would like, he has a obscene bench for his um, size. It helps that he has fairly short arms, but um, he would often have guys who had like 200 plus kilo bench presses come to him being like, why can't I bench 250 like you? And or did you 235? I can't remember. It was something, something insane. But basically he would spend so much time just working on structural balance in the system, like to make the whole system stronger. And this is what this whole chat's been about is like when thinking about making 
a program for your upper body. You want to make the whole system strong, not just component parts. And so that's where like bodybuilders, when they're just doing isolated movements and maybe don't have like an approach that does cover every um, thing and, and not doing it in a way that you're getting like the appropriate ratios of um, contribution from the different parts of your muscles as you do in a compound movement. Like there's nothing wrong with isolated movements and I use them um, specifically all the time. But um, when thinking about a structurally balanced program, like we want to have those big compound movements, so multi-joint movements happening um, in the way that Yanni explained before, but then also with an understanding of like, what are the, um, I guess, side effects of those big muscles? Like what else do they have um, that we need to account for? And particularly in the upper body, it's that internal rotation bias of the big muscles. So training that external rotation um, puts it from the category of like just a accessory movement into a fundamental movement where it's like, you got to have this in there because to make that whole system strong, um, we need to make sure there's external rotation in there. And then there's two types of external rotation that are important. And should I go into that now or? Um, Just give me a, give me a sec. Okay. Yeah. I want to really make this important. The, 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 Pete, you're probably wondering like, what, what does this mean for slap tear uh, for me with my slap tear and that sort of thing. And I did say at the start, this is so important for every type of training that you do. But what, what I want to make, re, uh, uh, you know, point out is like, how, what, why do we, get, why do we come imbalanced uh, in the first place? And the most common reason, and I'm going to be really brutally honest here is that People tend to train the muscles when they join a gym and they say, oh, I want to, most people join a gym for aesthetic reasons. You know, they, they join a gym because they want to look better, uh, whether they want to lose some weight or whether they want to build some muscle. Uh, they generally, you know, people say to me, oh, I want to just tone up, you know, or whatever, whatever that is. And, and unfortunately, under the, uh, uh, with, without the right guidance, people tend to train the muscles that they can see in the mirror. Those muscles are generally all in the front of the body, uh, chest, biceps, abs, things like that. You know, I know this from firsthand experience because this is what I did when I was in high school. You know, my first in introduction to the gym, all we did was bench press, bicep curls, and maybe a little bit of shoulder press, you know, and, and lots of ab crunches. Uh, and, and unfortunately, what that does is it, it creates an imbalance because you're not training the muscles you can't see in the back, which is the pulling muscles. You're certainly at that stage in your training life because you just don't know. You're not training external rotation in isolation and rotator cuff uh, exercises and things like that. Now, the second reason why people can come really imbalanced uh, is through lifestyle factors. You know, you might do a job or, you know, a classic example is when we're, uh, you know, driving a car for a living or working on a computer for a living, your body is adapting to the position it sits in most. So if you're sitting at a desk with, you know, working on a, a keyboard with, with a mouse, then you're constantly, your shoulders are internally rotated and, and in that sort of forward posture position. So your body adapts to that over time. And what that can do is it can, you know, uh, really, really um, switch off or disengage, or even you lose the neural connection to the muscles in the back um, uh, and, and the muscles that externally rotate the shoulder and the muscles that really are involved in that um, uh, upper body posture, you know, holding yourself upright. And it, it, it it's not, uh, because you're overtraining the other side. It's just frankly, because you're not using those muscles. And if you don't use it, you, you lose it, you know? And then lastly, uh, in, in uh, very, very specific strength sports, and this is going back to what uh, Phil was talking about there with Sebastian Orob, who, who, who generally trains uh, powerlifters. He specializes in powerlifting, but he's also trained mixed martial artists and all sorts of strongmen and, and, and all sorts of athletes, rugby league. Uh, but what he found was, People who are training for powerlifting, they're going to emphasize in their training the three lifts that they have to get good at, which is the you know uh, squat, bench press, and deadlift. And what they tend to forget is that the the opposing muscles that are creating that structural balance are extremely important for developing maximal strength, achieving your peak potential in those lifts. And uh, very commonly, yeah, he said, I don't do any bench with these guys that are doing uh, 200 kilo bench already, I, I strengthen the muscles in the back, the opposing muscles and the rotator cuff. And all of a sudden they increase their bench, you know, by five, 10%, which is what they've been trying to do for years and uh, unsuccessfully, you know, so, uh, it, it's, it's so important, but with, um, with slap tear, we spoke before about the fact that you can experience a slap tear through, you know, an overuse or a progressive, um, uh, mechanism nature or in an acute injury. And, Two very, very common reasons for both of those is poor anatomical structural balance. So when you develop an imbalance in your shoulder and then you try to use your shoulder in a way that it, you know, I, I spoke about the analogy before about the rigging on a ship. If you expose your shoulder to the storm, the strong wind, metaphorically speaking, which is an exercise that it's not often exposed to, then 
it's radically unprepared for that if there's an imbalance there. And vice versa, if you're maxing out on a lift and you're, you're getting so good at a lift, but the, the, the opposing muscles of the stability system, your, your bench press go, it starts to go beyond what they can handle, then you can um, experience an acute injury all of a sudden. Uh, and that's what happened with Rad. You know, he was trying to do all these handstands and these planches and his rotator cuff and his, his um, opposing muscles, he wasn't doing enough uh, pull-ups. He just didn't have the muscle mass to be able to withstand that. And he, he effectively eventually hit a, a um, uh, you know, an, an obstacle, which was uh, massive imbalance. And that resulted in a slap tear. Have you got anything that you would add to that? Yeah, so I think, like, again, just when, like, trying to make this as actionable and practical as possible and understanding why, like, doing, you know, there's obviously going to be certain exercises that you might get from a, a physio that are going to, like, they'll often add in these sort of external rotations because it's one of the things that people just, like, don't do and then they assume is kind of, <laughs> like, only if you get injured you do these things. But um, the the way to think about, like, why it's important to have that generalized structural balance approach is that, like I said it when I was talking about what the rotate like the rotator cuff does is it keeps the ball in the middle of the socket, which is also what the the labrum does as its primary role is like it's there as the passive support structure. So not something you can contract, it's just there as like cartilage that helps keep the ball in the middle of the socket. And ideally with passive support structures, there there is like the backup system and that the thing that gets primarily stressed when your shoulder is doing um, you know, this unwanted movement of the glide, is it should be from the structures that are infinitely like um able to like do that job recover do that job some more and recover so and that is your muscles so if we have strong musculature both at like from a prime mover big um picture level but then also like a structurally balanced like and functionally strong um in the unit so those stability muscles like if we have a lot of strength there then that's going to functionally unload the labrum so it won't have to be doing as much of that role and then that gives it less um you know it doesn't it's not going to be as like continually stressed over time. So like, I don't want to add too much like new concepts here, but we did talk about generally about like, you know, the, the exercise selection is going to be looking at like, can we get these big prime movements? And then it's all about just getting the right variables that are appropriate for um, where you currently are. And then thinking about how do we get those variables and fill in all the gaps to get you back to where like you want to get to. And so again, just to cover those five variables, which we talked about on like plenty of other episodes, but basically like how heavy is the weight how many like what's your volume the range of motion the speed of the movement and control and then the complexity or the exercise selection if you think about like each of the primary move the fundamental movements we talked about and then apply those variables in a like controlled and sort of scientific approach of like which ones hurt <laughs> and like can we reduce those while keeping other ones up and then um progressively increase those variables that you had to bring down which usually with this is going to be speed and range of motion because that's going to be the most like likely that you'll get into your backup systems um, of your shoulder. So like you can then do all of these fundamental movements, um, but in a non-aggravating way, if you just um, adjust those variables. And I know that's a complicated thing to like chuck in right at the end there, but that's the beautiful thing about strength training is it's like in infinitely incremental in how you do each of these movements. And there's always something that you will be able to do. Um, so you want to work with someone who understands like, the big picture, what movements we need to get, but also how can we adjust those fundamental movements by adjusting those variables and make it um, yeah, right for your level and then take you step by step to where you want to get to. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, to conclude this episode, I'd like to just reaffirm what we've sort of said here, which is that no matter what you're choosing to do, no matter what path you take, exercise and the right type of exercise is absolutely critical and uh structural balance and whether you're you know even if you're watching this and you haven't suffered a slap tear it's super important to understand that structural balance tra training in a manner that balances the physique properly and i'm not talking about just how you look in the mirror i'm talking about whether the the pushing muscles are in good balance with the pulling muscles and the you know the um in in the lower extremity it's whether the, the you know the the quads the knee extension muscles are in balance with the knee flexor muscles and and vice versa um th there are actually some really really great protocols that you can follow that like that have been sort of passed down through the ages from strength and conditioning coaches and and um uh sports exercise scientists that work really really well for athletes and general populations you know and and it, it we use a model of this uh, that we've also sort of uh, adapted uh that 
indicates what you should bench press to what you should be able to do a chin up in and, and, a, and a bent over row uh, versus what you should be able to squat and deadlift. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really, uh, I guess, um, going to complement your training journey as a whole to have a bit of an understanding of this, you know, and if you find this a little bit overwhelming or you feel like you'd like to learn more, then that's what we would really encourage you to get, you know, go a little bit deeper and and work with a coach who understands this sort of stuff, uh, not just the concepts of you know weight management, losing weight, and uh, or, or burning fat or burning calories or yeah, throwing and- you on a treadmill and and getting you to do some cardio exercise. Like someone who really fundamentally understands the strength training principles, the key principles which we we addressed here: structural balance training, progressive overload, and general load management. Because those three are going to be absolutely key to creating a a really good effective program. And uh, and beyond that, a rehab program if you've suffered a slap too. Yeah, and and just on that, like it's it's like people might hear like, oh, you know, you're saying do like bench, and I, there's no way I could possibly do bench. It hurts. And the the thing is like, there's so many different ways that you can adjust like a bench press with uh, different types of grip, different um, you know, mach- even like barbell versus machine versus um, you know, body versus weight. Dumb, like dumbbells. So it's, remember, okay, it's all yeah. about the fundamental movements, not the exercise in and of themselves so we can adjust the fundamental like which fundamental work, movement works for you and then we can adjust those variables so it's like infinitely adjustable that there's always always something that you can find that will work with you and that's why it's really like key to not just kind of take this and and run with it realize that like there are some you know while i did say it's like very simple in terms of like you know we just got to get these big movements it can be then um like quite sp- specific i guess about how it works for you in your, your specific context so do um yeah just keep that in mind and, and work with someone who understands um how to yeah. navigate that absolutely it, to give you a good example you know a pronated grip uh dumbbell press where the hands are in the pronated position may really really aggravate your shoulder but churning to a supinated grip may not and so therefore dumbbells may be the answer and choosing an incline or a flat or a decline can have yeah. major and dumbbells impact, might be you know. challenging because of the like inherent instability because you've got one hand and you don't have like and then you've got to get it into position and sometimes it is just getting into position that's the hardest bit rather than the actual exercise so that's yep. where doing a bench on a barbell or actually even you know using machines might be more appropriate to you so it's all about like understanding that like all the like big picture is very kind of simple in many ways um we do want to be quite specific about how we go about it so that's where um, absolutely come in absolutely and that's ex- exactly right so on that note uh we can you can uh find phil white at philwhite.me and of course you can find us at unitygym.com uh and we have uh some really really great options for you if you want to go down the path of uh strength training to overcome or rehab your slap tip hope you've liked this uh guys it's been a really really good series i think and i've enjoyed certainly enjoyed um producing it. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I always like to take a moment to just really um, uh, acknowledge that you've given us your time. And uh, if you've made it this far, and especially if you've watched all three of the episodes, then yeah, I commend you for that. It's th- There's so many things that you could be uh, giving your time to, uh, scrolling through social media, watching YouTube, listening to podcasts, and you've chosen to be here with us, uh, spending your time with us. And yeah, I want to thank you for that. And uh, thank you, Phil, for giving us your time as well. Always a pleasure. See you next time. Awesome, guys. Take care.